So yeah, let's uh, jump into specific plants that you want to chat about. This is Heart's Desire, which is a, a cultivar of um, uh, Ceanothus gloriosus, which is better known as uh, Point Race Ceanothus, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a, a vigorous ground cover. Uh, and this just is a, just a much more diminutive form. So when people are thinking of smaller Ceanothus, you know, it's not an oxymoron. There actually are um, smaller yeah. um, Ceanothus, <laughs> and this is one of them. Um, which I actually grow in our garden here, but which formed a, an effective little small scale ground cover in the trial up at the Oregon Garden. As with any other ground cover, um, it's weed suppressing capabilities, which is of course one of the main roles of any ground cover is increased with uh, the greater density and height of the canopy. So another one, which I really like, um, uh, and which was a real star in our trial and which again, I grow, is blue jeans. Oh um, yeah. yeah. So blue jeans is a different animal altogether, so to speak, yeah. than uh, Heart's Desire. It's a large, um, very textural because of the small leaves, um, evergreen shrub. So you need to have space for this one. It's probably the earliest to bloom of the Ceanothus that we had in our evaluation. Yeah, very hardy, like I've never that. seen any damage to it. Um, large and like all Ceanothus, uh, just uh, a magnet for pollinators. They're, they're yeah. really, really uh, phenomenal in that respect. I have to point out the um, both the Ceanothus pallidus and Ceanothus delilianus um, hybrid species. Those are hybrids between the Eastern North American species and Western North mm. American evergreen species. Um, mm. and what, what they've produced is these semi-deciduous uh, plants which bloom on new wood which is kind of cool because that means they bloom later than the um mm -hmm. than the evergreen species do which bloom on the previous seasons wood so this is a way of extending the flowering season of ceanothus yeah, into july um and so this is um i think this is gloire de versailles ceanothus de lilianus and there's others uh, cultivars of this particular hybrid out there as well, including topaz and Henri de Foss and so forth. And I, I like these for the same reason, they're, they're great pollinator plants as, a, as any other Ceanothus, but they're somewhat smaller, right? I mean, size, and also because they bloom on new wood, one has the ability to prune them in early spring to try to you know, reduce yeah. the size a little bit yeah. and keep it more manageable. So we had to pick amongst the Grevillea for landscape use in the Lamed Valley. Of course, this one, Grevillea victoriae, uh -huh. would rise quickly to the surface um, it's a great winter blooming. Actually, the bloom period probably for a hardy shrub is amongst the longest you could you could find. These plants will bloom from say December through April without okay. stopping really. Um, yeah, so I this shows so. a. I think this is a photo taken actually in April of uh, last year. Okay. So yeah, it's just. A phenomenal plant, uh, a real hummingbird magnet. If you didn't oh, have overwintering yeah. hummingbirds in your yeah. garden, you would have them yeah. if you had this available for they them. Would be there. So, a very uh, also very attractive to to um, bumblebees too when it's in bloom when they're uh -huh. active as well. So that winter bloom period, this is one of the stars of the winter garden in the Willamette Valley. So that's really an exciting plant, and it's proven to be more or less hardy. I think really cold winters do some damage to these, but they have a way of bouncing mm -hmm. back. The other one, which is very different, uh, which turned out to be very hardy for us, um, was uh, Grevillea australis, which as the name suggests oh, is right. um, found in Tasmania oh. and also in more southerly regions, also at higher elevation um, in southeastern parts of Australia. So uh, oh. very different in that it's, it's spring blooming. Uh, this photo was taken in March when it was in full bloom um, and the flowers are also fragrant. So it's a much smaller mm. plant. Um, okay. Bloom time is completely different. And then you've got that nice fragrance, which is, you know, it's not something you necessarily associate with Grevillea flowers, but this mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. definitely features. We did the, that evaluation of manzanitas as well. That was planted in 2011 and remained in, mm -hmm. growing ever larger mm. until um, till the end of 2019. Mm. And again, it's a genus which, um, has enormous diversity in terms of, if you consider nothing other than plant size oh, you know, yeah. everyone has heard of kinnikinnik of course yep. um, and we had 
part to staff University of Massachusetts in our trial, as well as um, some California selections of Uva Ursi as well, mm. uh, or hybrids with mm. Uva Ursi. And what we found was that they're, they're more drought tolerant. Massachusetts, of course, as the name suggests, was uh, grown from seed that was collected in the uh -huh. Northeast. Yeah. And so of all of the manzanitas we trialed over those eight years, the only one that ever showed any drought stress problems was Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, this is actually um, one called Anchor Bay, uh, which is a California selection of, coastal California selection of um, either Uva Ursi or, or a hybrid with Uva Ursi. And it mm -hmm. was just, it was more vigorous than, um, than Massachusetts. Uh, so a better ground cover from that respect, mm -hmm. but also never exhibited any signs of drought stress. And so um, since that included really hot dry years like 2015 and 2017, okay. 18, um, it just shows that, I mean, you, you, and I'm sure if we were to select from uh, populations of Uva Ursi in the Willamette Valley or in that area, we would similarly find greater drought tolerance than we yeah. get with Massachusetts, which is from a summer rainfall, cooler climate. If you're looking for a bit more ground cover, mm -hmm. then um, this <clears> is actually a plant that's included in our current broadleaf evergreen trial. This mm -hmm. is um, Arctostaphylos hookeri uh, wayside. Oh, okay. So wayside is one of a number of cultivars, which include mills, includes Buena Vista, includes Monterey mm -hmm. carpet, all of which are yeah selections of Arctostaphylos hookeri, which does um, in really cold winters get a little uh, tip, shoot tip dieback. Okay. But, you know, uh, the plant recovers from that. And so this okay. photo was taken in 2018 um, after the cold winter I think we had in 2016 was the last really cold event that we had. Um, so, you know, it's not showing any signs of injury. Um, and so this blooms in March just robust. If you've got a driveway bank or something of that nature that you just want to cover up, um, then Wayside and other cultivars of hooker eye um, have just proven to be really uh, good um, large-scale uh, ground covers. And then I can't leave um, Manzanita without talking about some of the explicitly winter-blooming ones. Um, the one I chose um, to talk about is one called Sentinel. Um, so this is Sentinel. The photo was taken oh, in sweet. January. Nice. And it's in full bloom in January. So it'll start in oh, December. Nice. And oh. as with many winter blooming things, it remains mm. in bloom for a long time because the temperatures are cool. So uh, that's one of the things about winter blooming shrubs in general is that the mm -hmm. length of the bloom period tends to be quite long, even though they are blooming on old wood. Um, so yeah. this covers itself with these clusters of blooms. Hummingbirds uh, can't get enough of this thing in the dead of winter, Yeah. as do pollinators that happen to get out on a warmer day. You know, once you get yeah. to 50, yeah. 60 degrees, you see pollinator activity in the Willamette Valley. So um, anyway, this was just a great, great cultivar, nice habit, um, and just enough of the bark and other mm -hmm. uh, parts of the uh, canopy um, revealed themselves over time. So it became a really attractive specimen year round with the added benefit of that winter bloom. This is Santalina magonica. And this is another plant that we brought back on a collecting trip Ooh. to um, Europe, in this case, to a nursery in the south of France. Huh. Um, and one That's of the things that. that we brought back were some Santalina. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you've grown <laughs> Santalina, then the, the, the most common Santalina is Santalina chemisiparis. Mm -hmm. And that just has kind of a, an unfortunate habit, if you like, uh, the way it blooms and produces flowers, um, it becomes kind of a mess uh, mm -hmm. after bloom. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I typically, I grow it. And what I do is I just take a electric head shearer to it with uh, abandon in early spring um, <laughs> to clean it up because uh -huh. it, they're really very messy plants to look at in the landscape once they're done blooming. Yeah. Um, what distinguishes a couple of the Santalinas that we brought back is this super tidy rounded habit. And of course the yeah. silver foliage as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't have any of that aesthetic drawback if you like um, during the off season, um, which Camisiparis does. So yeah. this is one which is in, you can see it's in this ground cover trial and it's just a, a better specimen, I guess you could say for year round interest without having to be 
um, given a massive haircut each spring in order yeah, to tidy the it up. Spring massacre, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I've found Santalinas, I will see, you know, whether this thing is as hardy as, uh, because I've never observed winter injury on the, the two or three mm -hmm. Santalinas that I've actually grown. They, they seem to be pretty hardy stuff. Pacific plant people. Pacific Region industry leaders offer advice you can use right now in your own garden. Climate appropriate plant recommendations in an ecological, naturalistic context. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe like and share our videos.